Hi, this is Sue Jackson of the Book by Book blog, and I'm here today with my April reading wrap-up. I can't believe it's the end of April already. It seems like it went by really fast. I'm also coming to you from a different location because just as I sat down to record today, the neighbor's lawn service started up with multiple leaf, leaf blowers all at once. <laughs> so I am in the furthest corner of the house, which happens to be our bedroom. And um, so the shelf behind me is different than the one you usually see. This is our TBR shelf, which um, I'll include a full picture so that you can see. It is overloaded with books waiting to be read. Um, this little horizontal stack here is my husband's, along with a few more over here. Most of the rest of it is mine. <laughs> yeah, I've got a problem, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I hope you enjoy the change of scenery and I hope the background noise isn't too bad. I have sealed myself off as well as I can. I once again got my handy reading log, which is almost full. I told my husband I need a new one for Mother's Day. I finished five books in April. The number's a little lower than usual because there are a couple um, that I'm still in the middle of that I will probably finish in a few days, um, including two audios. So of the five books, three were in print and all three of those were for Booktopia, the annual event I go to in Vermont each May. I'll include a link down below for more information. I also read a graphic memoir on ebook and listen to one audiobook which was a YA. I've got two other audiobooks going right now because my husband and I started one on vacation that we haven't finished yet and I'm reading one last listening to one last book for Booktopia because it starts in a few days. <laughs> so excited. So, here's what I read in April. I started the month with Unlikely Animals by Annie Hartnett. Um, this is a Booktopia author. I'm going to get to meet her at the end of this week. And um, this so far is my favorite of the Booktopia books. They've all been good, but really, really loved this one. Um, it's a very warm story that is also very, very funny although some difficult things happen in it. It tackles things like terminal illness, drug addiction. There are some difficult topics here, but it's all done with this wonderful sense of humor and so warm-hearted. I just, I didn't want to leave these characters when the book ended. So it begins with Emma, who is 22 years old. She is returning to her small hometown in New Hampshire it's a small rural town because, um, well, basically her parents think she just started med school a few months ago and she didn't. <laughs> she was accepted. She was supposed to start and she did not. So she's coming home feeling at loose ends in her life. She doesn't know what's next. She doesn't know what's right for her. The main reason Emma is coming home is because her father is dying. He's got some sort of brain disease um, that the doctors haven't been able to diagnose exactly, but they know that it's getting worse and they know that he's dying. So she's come home to spend some time with her father. Her older brother also lives with her parents still um, because he's just out of his second run through rehab. So he's been struggling as well. So things are really rough in Emma's family right now. But what's going on with her dad also has its funny moments because he is hallucinating and mostly he's hallucinating animals. Um, and one person, and the author says this is, this part is taken from real life. This is true. There was a well-known naturalist in this part of New Hampshire 
although the town is fictional, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, his name is Ernest Harold Baines. He went by Harold. And as you can see in this picture, um, he had a habit of taking wild animals, bringing them into his home and taming them, including this pet fox that he had. So Emma's dad, Clive, can see and talk to Harold and Harold talks back to him. So this real life story of this real life naturalist is woven into this novel in a really fun way. The author explained that she loved this piece of history she found locally, and she wanted to incorporate it into her book, but she didn't really want to write historical fiction. She wanted to write a modern day novel. So, he's a ghost. <laughs> and speaking of ghosts, the other unusual thing about this novel is that it is narrated by a bunch of dead townspeople in the local cemetery. I know that sounds really strange, but it works. It's actually a really cool narration device and it works very effectively and it's a lot of fun. So Emma gets a part-time job as a fifth grade school teacher. They need a substitute because their teacher is um, by her husband's side in court where he's being tried as a drug dealer. So there's all this stuff going on in town and in Emma's family. I loved the inclusion of the fifth grade class because these fifth graders are just great um, and a whole lot of fun. I absolutely loved Unlikely Animals by Annie Hartnett. It's a delightful novel and I highly recommend it. Next, I fit in a, a YA graphic memoir, In Limbo by Deb J.J. Lee. This is a coming of age memoir, um, though Deb dealt with some unique challenges. Um, she was born in Korea and brought up in New Jersey. So she had this, you know, feeling torn between two cultures thing going on. Um, she also had an abusive mother, which was a big effect on her life. So Deb is dealing with some serious mental health issues, severe anxiety, depression. Um, she did attempt suicide. The novel is really about her healing journey and discovering art was a big part of that. So, um, you know, in the novel, some of it is kind of typical high school stuff. Here's a picture of her first day in high school and you know, overwhelming for anyone, let alone someone with struggling with anxiety. Um, so there's some typical high school stuff going on, you know, trying to do well in school, um, trying to have friends. She's really struggling. Um, her oldest friend, really her only friend at the start of the, of high school, has a boyfriend and so she's not spending as much time with Deb anymore. She meets a new friend and there are some issues there. Um, so some of it is about friendship and meeting new people. Um, but it is also, as I said, about art. Here she's showing her violin teacher some of her artwork um, and deciding not to continue with the violin. And so, you know, one summer, Deb goes to an art school in New York City, and that really changes her life. So In Limbo is Deb's coming of age story, her healing journey. She's in therapy throughout the memoir, and that helps a lot too. And by the end, she goes off to college after a visit to Korea, which is also life-changing for her. So that's In Limbo a graphic memoir by Deb J.J. Lee. Next up was another book for Booktopia, A Flaw in the Design by Nathan Oates. Um, this one takes place in Vermont. You do see a lot of New England authors at Booktopia since it's held in Vermont. Although there's usually a good mix of authors 
diverse authors from different backgrounds in different places. But um, this is a psychological suspense novel. In the beginning of it, there is a man named Gil and his wife, Molly. They have two daughters who are 11 and 15. And the four of them live a happy life in uh, Vermont, um, outside of Burlington. Gil is a college professor teaching literature and writing. Molly is an artist. They used to live in New York City, which Molly loved and Gil had trouble with. Gil has some history here of some mental health struggles, anxiety. So as this novel opens, this peaceful existence that they've created for themselves in Vermont is being threatened by their nephew. They have a 17 year old nephew named Matthew. He's been living in New York with his parents who are extremely wealthy. So Upper East Side penthouse apartment, um, expensive private school, the whole nine yards. His parents were just killed in a horrible car accident in the city. And um, Gil's sisters, Will, said that Gil and Molly are the guardians for Matthew. So Matthew's coming to live with them. Now, besides the obvious culture clash here, going from a wealthy upbringing in New York to this quiet rural life in Vermont, Matthew has some history. Um, something happened, and you don't know exactly what at the very beginning of the novel, though it, it's revealed fairly early, that involved Matthew and their younger daughter. Something that makes them fear that and observations of Matthew when he was younger, that makes them fear that their nephew could very well be a psychopath. And um, so that's the tension in this novel. And tension's the right word. There is a lot of tension right from the start. So you're wondering, as the reader, you're wondering all along, is Matthew really a psychopath? There are some odd things you know, that he does and that he has done in the past. Or is Gil in a downward spiral? I mean, he clearly is in a downward spiral during this novel, but is Gil just paranoid? Has his nephew grown up and matured, um, grown out of whatever it was that, that um, made him act and behave in such strange ways when he was younger? So that's the tension in the novel. Is Matthew really a psychopath, as a serious danger in their midst and around their daughters? Or is Gil paranoid? Is he letting his anxieties get away from him? That tension continues all the way through the novel, right to the end. Um, it's a very suspenseful novel, very dark. It was um, interesting reading this while camping a couple weeks ago in um, in Virginia, you know, sitting around in the dark around a campfire or in our camper at night reading this very creepy, very tense novel. Um, but it's excellent psychological suspense. That's A Flaw in the Design by Nathan Oates. At the beginning of the month, I listened to an audiobook. This was a YA audiobook, and I can already tell you, this will be on my list of best YA books for the year. Um, it's called This Is Our Place by Vitor Martin. Um, it takes place in Brazil, and it's a very unique novel. Um, this was a month for unique narrators. <laughs> Unlikely Animals was narrated by the dead people in the cemetery. This book, This Is Our Place, was narrated by the house. There is a single house, and the story the house is narrating to us is the story is told from three different points in time. A young girl named Anna, who lived in the house in 2000 with her father. Um, they were there for the turn of the millennium. Um, her father was a computer, worked with computers. So 
not many houses had computers at that time, but they did. And um, shortly after they celebrate New Year's together, Anna's father tells her that they're going to move soon. Anna's 17, 16 or 17, she's lived in this house her whole life. She doesn't want to leave the house, but more importantly, she doesn't want to leave her girlfriend. She has a wonderful girlfriend. They're very much in love. Things have been going really great. So that's what's taking place in 2000. The story shifts to 2010. And in 2010, there is a young man named Greg. He is 17, um, also gay, living in the house with his aunt. Greg's parents have been fighting a lot. He knows they're going to get divorced, but they're not talking about it. And they've sent him away so that they can work things out some way or another. So Greg is temporarily living with his aunt in this same house that Anna lived in. And um, his aunt, this takes place in 2010, his aunt runs a video rental store, which is quickly becoming obsolete because of streaming. So Greg is helping his aunt in her store he loves the town. Um, he lives in, I think, in San Paulo, so a big city. He loves the town. And, um, and he really likes this cute boy who's been delivering him food. I think he's the son of one of his aunt's friends. So that's what's happening in 2010. In 2020, we meet Beto. So it's 2020, so you know what that means. Um, it's the middle, well, it's the start of the pandemic. Um, Brazil is in lockdown. So Beto is stuck in the house with his mom and soon his older sister leaves college and comes to join them because she was in an apartment all by herself. Actually, I think her sister, his sister might've been out of college and working, but she was all alone in an apartment in the city. So she comes home for the duration of the lockdown. So the three of them are in the house together. And of course, we all went through this. You know what that's like. Their whole world is inside that house. Beto is very into photography and it's really difficult for him not to be able to go out in the world and take photos. Beto is also gay. I think he's also 17. He, um, he's been flirting online over texting with a boy that he really likes. And he seems to like him too, but it's all been online because of the pandemic. So that's the situation with each of these teenagers in a different decade living in the same house. It's a completely unique concept. I loved it. Really, each of the stories is equally engaging. I was completely engrossed in the audiobook and really enjoyed This Is Our Place by Vitor Martens. Um, highly recommend this. Whether you like YA or not, um, because a lot of it is things that we adults can can relate to as well. My final book for April was Brother and Sister Enter the Forest by Richard Mirabella. Um, I've just finished this one. This is another Booktopia book. I will get to meet the author at the end of this week. This is obviously about a brother and sister. It begins um, when they're adults. Justin, the older brother, shows up at his younger sister Willa's apartment. They're both adults now. She works as a nurse. She hasn't seen Justin in several years. He just shows up on her doorstep. He is homeless. He is clearly not healthy. Um, and some things have happened in the past that we don't know about at the beginning to make Willa not certain that she really wants to let Justin back into her life, but she does. The novel takes place in two different timelines. The present, where Justin and Willa are getting reacquainted as adults, still dealing with some stuff from their childhood, and also back in the past when they were both teenagers. Um, 
the focus is really on Justin and his kind of coming of age story. He was a gay teen and something very traumatic happened to him when he was 17 that affected the whole family. Now, we don't know what that is for much of the book. It, it, it's slowly revealed. So it, it's going, the two timelines, while there are two separate timelines, each one is moving chronologically. So in the present day, we're moving forward. And in the past, we start um, when I think Willa is 15 and Justin is 17, and it moves forward until you get to this traumatic event that happened to Justin. And so what happened in the past is clearly still affecting them in the future. Justin is definitely suffering from severe anxiety and probably some other mental health issues as well, but we don't really know what at the beginning. This is a very intimate book about the brother-sister relationship, about family. Um, their mother was not a real warm, fuzzy person. That created issues as well. It was a very engaging story. Um, I, I started this while we were camping as well and never wanted to put it down and was always looking forward to picking it back up again. So very much, it, it's, it's a darker story, but like in Limbo, it's about a healing journey. So that's Brother and Sister Enter the Forest by Richard Mirabella. Another excellent Booktopia book. I can't wait to meet these authors at the end of this week. Um, and when I get back, I will tell you all about Booktopia. In the meantime, I have linked to my um, video from 2022 below, so you can take a look at that. And um, I want to know what you read in April. Um, as I said, my favorite book of the month was definitely Unlikely Animals by Annie Hartnett. Um, although This Is Our Place was a close second, definitely my favorite YA book so far this year. I wanna hear what your favorites were in April. Let me know in the comments down below about any books that you read in April and loved.